Now that we understand that a two-dimensional Fourier transform is a decomposition of an image into its component sine waves, let's look at how that transform could be represented in another image. So let's begin here with an imaginary image of just some uh, simple object that I drew. And let's suppose that in this image uh, we have 10 pixels in X and 10 pixels in Y. And it's a digital image. It's a grayscale. So the pixels have values from 0 up to 9, where the image is very dark, and 0 where it's, it's light. And as you can see, in some pixels where the object only cuts through part of a pixel, it gets an intermediate value of, say, 6. Here in this case, uh, the object only touches a little bit of the pixel, so we give it a value of 1. These are just numbers that I obviously made up. But the point is that you could have an image of an object that was digitized into a series of numbers. Now, what would it look like if we sent that digital image to a Fourier transform routine in the computer? What would it reply with? It turns out that the output of the Fourier transform routine will be another two-dimensional array of numbers. And the pattern of numbers is readily understood. So here, the Fourier transform of this two-dimensional image will be a series of numbers, a two-dimensional array of numbers. And in this case, instead of being organized as x and y values, now the numbers have h and k indices. These are the same Miller indices that we've talked about previously. And so the values of h are going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in an image that has 10 pixels across. And the values of k are from 0 to positive 5 and to negative 5. And for instance, this first set of values, uh, this would be the amplitude of the h equals 0, k equals 0 wave, and the phase of the h equals 0, k equals 0 wave. Well, what is the 0, 0 wave? This is a wave that has 0 oscillations across the box in x and 0 oscillations across the box in y. In other words, it's flat. It's just a simple constant value, just like the, uh, the first term in a one-dimensional Fourier transform represented the average value of the function. So here, the 0, 0 wave represents the average value of all the pixels in this whole image. And so it's, it's, uh, it just represents a constant number across that image. The next uh, position, let's look at this one. These two values that the computer would respond with are the amplitude of the h equals 0, k equals 1 wave, and the phase of that same 0, 1 wave. And so this is the wave that has one oscillation across the box in x and none in y, the very first wave that we've uh, represented a couple times now. And here is its amplitude, and here is its phase. Let's look in this position. The computer will respond with the amplitude and the phase of the 1, 0 wave. So you see these indices of the h and k values of the waves, uh, that is how the computer will arrange the amplitudes and phases of all the Fourier components of the image as it responds back to us as the output of the Fourier transform routine. In similar fashion, this is where we'll find the amplitude and the phase of the 0, 5 wave. This is the amplitude and phase of the 0, minus 5 wave. Um, this is the amplitude and phase of the 2, 0 wave, the 5, 0 wave, the 5, 5 wave, the 5, negative 5 wave. And the pixels in between, for instance here, have amplitudes and phases of all the other possible waves present in the image. So for instance here, this is the amplitude and phase of the h equals 2, k equals 3 wave, a wave that has two oscillations across the box in x and three oscillations in y. Now one of the important principles here is that the original digital image with all its pixel values and its Fourier transforms, namely 
the set of amplitudes and phases of all of these different waves have exactly the same information content. In other words, if in the original image we have n squared numbers, n squared pixel values, in the Fourier transform, so too we have approximately n squared numbers. Notice that here h goes from 0 to 5 and k goes from minus 5 to positive 5, approximately 10 values. And so 10 times 5 sine waves is 50 sine waves. But each sine wave has both an amplitude and a phase. And so to describe each sine wave, we have two numbers, amplitude and phase. And so these are all of the sine waves that you need to represent this digital image. There aren't any others. So for instance, remember we talked about the Nyquist frequency, that in a one-dimensional function, the Nyquist frequency was the wave that oscillated in every other box, every other pixel. In two-dimensional images, there's also a Nyquist frequency. It's here. This is a wave that oscillates, at least across x, every other pixel. If there's 10 pixels in the image, then the Nyquist frequency is the frequency with five wavelengths across the box. So it's going up and down every other pixel. And the Nyquist frequency in the vertical direction, in k, is also 5, meaning that represents a wave that's going up and down every other pixel in y. Now, in a two-dimensional image, the highest frequency wave present is this one in the corner, which actually has five oscillations in x and five oscillations in y. And so it grows across the box diagonally a little over seven times. So that's now the highest spatial frequency present. But the important is that there is no component in this image of a sine wave that has six oscillations across the box because that would start to be oscillations up and down all within the same pixel. And so that wave is simply not present in a digital image that's been sampled with just 10 pixels across. These waves are all that you need to perfectly represent the original image. They're called Nyquist. Now, the reason that the Fourier transform has a few extra than n squared values that are returned back is because there is an extra row here of h equals 0 sine waves and uh, some redundancies. For instance, the 0 minus 5 wave uh, looks just like the 0, 5 wave. You can't tell whether it's going up or whether it's going down across the box. So there are a, a few extra values that come through in a Fourier transform beyond the n squared numbers that define the original image. But to a first approximation, if you have an image with n squared numbers, the Fourier transform comes back with n squared numbers. They're different numbers. They represent amplitudes and phases of sine waves. It's like uh, saying the same thing in two different languages. This is the real space language, which are actual uh, pixel values. This is the Fourier transform language where the values represent amplitudes and phases of component sine waves. Now it's difficult to appreciate the information content if we look at the actual numerical values in the two-dimensional Fourier transform. Instead what we like to do is plot them in two dimensions. And let me introduce you to that now. So this is a simple two-dimensional image and its transform. Uh, We'll learn later that the transform of an image is, is the same as its diffraction pattern. And so that's why I've written that here. So let's look at a very simple 2D image. Here it is, and you'll recognize now that it's simply one sine wave that's oscillating back and forth as it crosses the box. And we call this, and the coordinates are x and y, and this is real space. That's the actual image. Now if we record its Fourier transform, that's what appears here. The axes in a Fourier transform is first spatial frequency in the x direction, which is indexed with that Miller index, index h. And the vertical axis is spatial frequency in the y direction, indexed with the Miller index, index k. 
And so the transform of this image is very simple. It only has one sine component in it. And so its transform is two dots, one right here and another right here. So in this image, this is a sine wave uh, with 10 oscillations across the box. So it's the h equals 10, k equals 0 sine wave. And we can plot the amplitude of the h equals 10, k, k equals 0 wave. We could plot its amplitude right here. And typically, instead of plotting amplitudes, we plot power, or the intensity, which is just the amplitude squared. And so we get a, a strong uh, intensity here and a strong intensity here. This represents the minus 10 zero wave, which from a computer's point of view, it's the same wave. We can't tell whether the wave is going to the left or to the right. It looks the same. And so the 10 zero wave and the minus 10 zero wave are just mirrors of each other. They're the same thing. And so the computer uh, responds that there are uh, two waves present in this image, here and here. And if we plot their amplitudes, we see values here and here. And the rest of the plot is zero because there are no other waves present in this image. And so we call this the reciprocal space. And uh, the frequencies here, we call them spatial frequencies. OK, let's do another simple 2D image and its transform. So here is the real space image in x and y. And you might notice, well, this is a sine wave that's oscillating vertically. And it has 10 oscillations across the box. So here's our reciprocal space with uh, spatial frequencies in the x and the y direction. And what would the Fourier transform of this image look like? Can you guess? Well, the Fourier transform of this image just has two uh, non-zero values, one right here and one right here, representing the 0, 10 wave and the 0, minus 10 wave. These are waves that have 10 oscillations across the box vertically, no oscillations in x. And uh, again, uh, the 10, 0, or, or the 0, 10, and the 0, minus 10 waves are indistinguishable. So we see those two values appearing in the Fourier transform. Now let's look at some more complex 2D images and their transforms. Let's start with this 2D image. This is a diagonal wave with 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 oscillations across the box in x and 1, 2, 3, 4 in y. What would its transform look like? Well, the answer is two spots very near the origin. So in this case, the origin of this Fourier transform is about there. And this is spatial, direct, spatial frequency in the x direction, and this is spatial frequency in the y direction. From zero spatial frequency, or, which represents the sine wave that's flat all the way across the box, to the edge of this image is the Nyquist frequency, which represents a sine wave that's going up and down every other pixel. Now, this is not going up and down every other pixel. and we, we can't tell how finely this image is sampled. But the sine wave that's present in this image, it's just one sine wave. And it's the h equals 4, k equals 4 wave. So we have a single non-zero value right there. And then its mirror image across the origin, representing the minus 4, minus 4 wave, which are in indistinguishable. So the Fourier transform of this image is just two dots, one here and one there, and the rest is all zero. Well, how about this image? In this image, we still just have one sine wave, but there's a couple differences. First of all, it has very many oscillations in x and very many oscillations in y, and the crests are headed towards the lower right corner. So what would, be, what would the Fourier transform look like? Well, in this case, the Fourier transform is, again, two dots equal distant, equidistant from the origin. And it's an h equals perhaps 20, and k equals minus 20 wave. So it has uh, approximately 20 oscillations in this direction and 20 oscillations in this direction across the box. And it's a minus k. Uh, wave 
and that is what tells us that it's headed towards the lower right corner. So if you'll notice, if you have sine waves, uh, the position of the dot in reciprocal space that represents that sine wave is in a direction that's perpendicular to the crests of the wave. In this case, perpendicular was this direction, and so the spots appeared in that direction in the Fourier transform. In this case, the perpendicular to the crest is in this direction, and so we move in that direction to find the position of that wave in reciprocal space. And then it has its uh, mirror image across the origin. Okay, let's look at the next wave. So in this case, it's still a single sine wave, but now the frequency is much lower. The oscillation, there's, very, there's far fewer oscillations across the box, and it has a little bit different direction. What will its Fourier transform look like? Well, the answer is, it's two very closely spaced dots on either side of the origin. And the reason they're so close to the origin is because it represents the h equals 1 wave, because there's just one oscillation across the box in x, and the k equals 2 wave, because there's just two oscillations across the box verti vertically. So it's very close to the origin. It represents a very slowly varying wave. And it is uh, positioned one unit over an x and two units down from the origin. And so if you look at the perpendicular to the crest, that's the direction from the origin where that spot is found. OK, now we're ready for this last, most complicated image. Suppose this is an image that you recorded. What would its Fourier transform be? Now I'll give you a hint. This image is the sum of this one and this one and this one. Do you see how this pattern is the sum of these three images? So what would the Fourier transform of this be? Did you guess it right? It is all of the spots present in these three Fourier transforms. In other words, an image that is the sum of three different sine waves in the Fourier transform you'll see spots representing all three sine waves present. So the origin is approximately there in this image. This spot represents the sine wave over here that's oscillating across the box towards the upper right corner. This wave represents this fastly varying high frequency wave that's going from the upper left to the lower right. And this dot represents this slowest varying wave that uh, is headed in this direction. And these three spots are their mirror images across the origin. So in other words, what we see in the Fourier transform of the image is each component separated as a single spot in the image. Now the way that this image is related to the array that I showed you that the computer would return as the output of the Fourier transform routine. That array had all of the different pixel values from h, in the case I showed you, h equals 0 to 5, k from negative 5 to positive 5, and there was all those different pixels. Well, if we simply plot the square of the amplitude of each pixel in a space like this, then where a sine wave is present and it has a finite amplitude, it will appear we can plot its intensity by how dark we make that spot. So in this case, all of these three waves had essentially the same amplitude, and so they all look like three similarly intense spots. And there's nothing around them because all the other waves in between have an amplitude of zero, meaning they're not present in the image. And that's why this power spectrum looks so simple with just six dots representing three different waves. And they all have approximately the same amplitude. But real images are, of course, far more complex. But these principles will help you understand their Fourier transforms. So we're all ready to a point where we can understand 
um, one of the figures of uh, a recent paper from my group. And in this project, we were imaging the chemoreceptor arrays of bacterial cells. So here is a slice of a three-dimensional tomogram of a cell. And all that you need to know at this point is that it's a two-dimensional image of a section through a cell. And this cell has a series of receptors that bind together in a hexagonal lattice. So you can begin to see these receptors bound together in a hexagonal lattice. It's an EM image. And we, these receptors, we were interested in how they're packed together. And with images like this, we could see that there was some kind of pattern. So to discover the pattern, we calculated Fourier transforms of the images. Now in this particular paper, we were comparing how the receptors packed in about 11 different organisms. So this panel is a slice of a tomogram where we see the pattern in one particular species, and this is its Fourier transform. And you see a very nice clean pattern of one dot in the middle and then six uh, dots surrounding it. And that's because this image is almost entirely dominated by three sine waves, this one, this one, and this one, that travel in this direction, this direction, and this direction. And together they build up this hexagonal lattice. This is the characteristic for a transform of a hexagonal pattern. And so we, we could see that in this species, the, the receptors were arranged in a hexagonal lattice. Now in the next species, we saw that the receptors were again arranged in a nice hexagonal lattice, as evidenced by the Fourier transform of that image. And so in all the species that we imaged, and here are all of the examples, the same Fourier transform evidenced the same basic hexagonal lattice. And so in this case, the Fourier transforms of all these images were all that we needed to argue that the receptors were packed similarly in all these different species. Now, the images of many objects are even more complex than a hexagonal pattern. They could be any kind of an image. So let's look at a, a classic example in structural biology, which is the image uh, of a duck. So here's the image of a duck. It's black and white. And here is its Fourier transform. So you need to remember that in the Fourier transform, this is plotted as a function of two different variables spatial frequency in the x direction and spatial frequency in the y direction. And so this image is a series of pixels. I'm drawing them extra big here, but it's a series of pixels. Pixels, you know, fill this image. Um, and uh, each pixel represents one of the possible sine waves that could be present or not in this image. Now, more precisely, all of these sine waves are present in this image, just some are at very low amplitude and some are at very high amplitude. The ones at very low amplitude uh, here look black because we're plotting their intensity or their amplitude squared. So these are very low numbers. And here near the origin, these sine waves are present with high amplitude in the image. And so they appear bright. Uh, now, note that we don't plot the phase anywhere. These uh, two-dimensional plots of the Fourier transform uh, only give you information about the amplitudes of each Fourier component. That's another term that we use to mean each sine wave in the image. Each sine wave can be called a Fourier component. And we simply plot their amplitude squared, or their intensity. We, we don't represent their phase here in these images. These images are also called power spectra. And you'll hear that word a lot. This is a power spectrum. Plural is power spectra. And uh, the power spectra show you the power of each Fourier component or sine wave uh, in this image. And so we use power as a synonym for the intensity, the amount of each sine wave present. Now we can introduce the meaning of the, word, of the term resolution. 
We have before considered that the pixels near the origin in these power spectra represent sine waves that oscillate slowly, maybe once across the box. That's the first pixel. Maybe three or five times across the box. That's the third pixel and the fifth pixel. But these pixels near the origin represent very slowly varying features in the image. And so we call those low resolution. On the other hand, pixels near the edge of the power spectra, these represent waves that are oscillating very rapidly in the image. Perhaps every other pixel, they're up and down. That would be the Nyquist frequency. And so we talk about those as high resolution, high frequency components of the image. So let's consider this picture of a person in front of a blackboard. And you can clearly see the features of his face. You can even see what he's written on the blackboard. Now, if we calculate the Fourier transform of that image, we get this complicated pattern. And remember that this is spatial frequency in the x direction, spatial frequency in the y direction. So these pixels near the origin, they represent slowly varying waves uh, that are present in this image. Pixels at the extreme edges of the Fourier transform represents rapidly oscillating waves. For instance, waves that even may oscillate up and down in every other pixel. Uh, these are oscillations across the x direction. These represent waves that are oscillating in the vertical direction. These are waves, for instance, that are oscillating diagonally across the image and everything in between. Every pixel in this Fourier transform represents one two-dimensional sine wave that could be present in this image. And the, and the brightness of the pixel represents its intensity. Well, if we then took the Fourier transform of this Fourier transform, we took another Fourier transform, what we, we would get back is the original image of the person with his writing on the chalkboard. In other words, if you take the a, a Fourier transform moves you from real space to reciprocal space, then if you take another Fourier transform, you might call it an inverse Fourier transform, but it works the same way. You would recover the original image in real space. And so each time you take the Fourier transform, it just switches the representation from real to reciprocal to real to reciprocal and vice versa. Uh, Fourier transforms just change which space the image is being represented in. And so you would get an identical image here to the original by taking two Fourier transforms. However, if instead of using all the pixels in this Fourier transform, if we just use a set of them. So here, this is the same Fourier transform of this image. But this time, we're only going to include the pixels in the middle of the image near the origin. And we're going to zero, just multiply by zero, all of these other values. So we just zero out the Fourier transform all around here. If we then take the Fourier transform of that, we get an image that resembles the original, but the details are gone. So here you see the outlines of the man's face, but we've lost details, for instance, uh, particular uh, hair, um, locks of hair. We've lost the details of the writing on the chalkboard, uh, many of the features of the eye. And this is called a low-pass filter because we've only transmitted, we, we have filtered the Fourier transform and blocked off all of the high-frequency components and passed only the low-frequency components. So in a low-pass filter, you pass only those sine waves near the origin, which are slowly varying, and you get an image that's lost the details. Now, as you can imagine, you could do the inverse. Instead, you could take this original Fourier transform with all the information you need 
and instead you could zero out the pixel values near the origin. So here these are blocked out, but all of the higher frequency components are allowed to pass through. And if we take the Fourier transform of this, now we get an image that again resembles the original image. In this case, it has all the high frequency details, all the little details like you can read the writing on the chalkboard just fine, you can see individual locks of his hair, some details of the shirt. But now what's missing is the low frequency components because the wave that contains that information, namely that this side of the image is dark and this side of the image is generally bright, that wave would be one that oscillated, it would have a minimum here and a maximum over here. And that is a slowly varying wave. And so that wave would appear very close to the origin here. And it is zeroed out. And so in the filtered image, you don't see, you lose this information that this side was generally dark and that side was generally bright. And they look rather comparable but you still have the high frequency details because they were contained in these pixels. This is called a high pass filter because you're passing the high frequency components, the details. Well, you can imagine any number of filters. This filter would contain neither the lowest frequency components nor the highest frequency components, but it would instead it would only pass a few of the sine waves present in this middle range. And this is called a band pass filter because we're passing through the Fourier transform just a single band of spatial frequencies. And the image, these images can be hard to interpret. You can s still see the general outline of the man's head, but neither the high frequency details like the writing on the chalkboard nor the low frequency information like that this is generally dark and that's supposed to be generally white. All of that is gone and you only see the middle range detail present in the image.